let's start the second session of our uh, workshop on, uh, on uh, architectural approaches in circuit 2D. So uh, welcome back. And uh, in the first session, uh, we already had a, a nice discussion about collaborative approaches uh, between academia and, uh, and industry. Um, and we had uh, contributions from uh, Ulich, uh, IBM and, and Oak Ridge. And of course, if you, if you missed one of these, uh, feel free uh, to uh, either contact us um, and we can provide you with a recording or a, a recording will be available through the IEEE website for some time now. Good. Um, then uh, even more, I'm happy now to start the, the next session, uh, which is on um, architectural approaches uh, on the hardware level. So everything essentially taking place mainly in the lower levels of the quantum stack. Of course, the upper levels are still uh, very important. And uh, here we will be looking to, for, uh, forward to, uh, to contributions from uh, Irfan Siddiqui and Florent Lecoq and, and John Martinez. And um, what we will uh, also do, and in case you missed the, the first uh, part, is we will uh, show you some questions. Uh, and initially the idea was that, that we pulled them live, but um, since this is not available for, for people, for example, tuning in via uh, via the website uh, or via an app, um, then uh, we will actually uh, try to do a slightly different approach now and we will show you the questions. And, and the idea would be that uh, everyone uh, also in the audience um, uh, quickly takes a bit of time and, and thinks about them. Um, and then there will be the talks and then in the end we will show the questions again and, and we, will, we would like to ask in the audience to uh, give uh, in the chat uh, a quick comment whether whether uh, whether the speakers or so could change their opinions or or whether they they even reinforce their opinions um, and then in this way the idea would be to to start this uh, a general discussion about um, about general architectural approaches and um, yes and and uh, of course what is always uh, so here are the questions. Um, so we have essentially three uh, different ones. And the first one, it is uh, it's, uh, on, the lev on which level do we need uh, cold electronics or, or a, a different approach from the, from this, um, from the, uh, um, from the, from the coaxial approach, uh, for example, in SFQ or, or cold CMOS. Um, this can be at the 100 qubits level where we are roughly now, maybe at the 1000 qubit level and million, million level or more, or maybe even never. And then there's uh, different approaches to, to qubits, uh, for example, static and frequency tuning qubits. And, and is there a sort of, what in your opinion, is there, is there someone here which, which will be dominating in the future? Will this be either one of them or uh, may only a clever combination of both? Uh, or will it be re rather a, a completely different technology or, or a different type of qubit? And then uh, what are the biggest or what is the biggest challenge going forward uh, in terms of chip architecture and this hardware level? Uh, so is this, uh, uh, for example, control multiplexing uh, or crosstalk uh, frequency crowding? Um, is it a general problem that, that uh, we maybe never really be able to increase the coherence times to a, a suitable level or is it maybe something else? Um, so uh, with this, uh, I would like to actually um, give the, the word uh, directly to, to Irfan. He will uh, share his screen then. And uh, just uh, while he sets this up, um, let me one, uh, let me give a, a quick uh, one last, um, last comment. And it's, it's very important uh, that you help us uh, in making this an excited uh, interactional um, workshop or a session in terms of uh, that you uh, please write your questions at any time in the chat and, and my co-hosts will then uh, sort uh, through them and it will highlight them for me and I will I will ask these questions to the to the speakers uh, but this is this can be questions but it can also be comments maybe in general so if you have a comment on on a certain uh, or certain um, something which which one of the speakers said feel free to also uh, give a comment uh, whether you agree or disagree. Good. So with this, I, I stop screen sharing now, and I will, uh, um, and Irfan will uh, start his screen share. Just a few small words for him. So he's a faculty scientist at, at Lawrence Berkeley 
National Labs and professor of physics at uh, UC Berkeley. And in his research, he's doing uh, metrology and computing problems uh, and fundamental questions uh, using uh, superconducting circuits. And uh, of course, he's a fellow uh, of the American Physical Society and, and uh, in 2006 was awarded the, the APS George E. Valley Junior Prize uh, for the development of the uh, bifurcation amplifier. And uh, with this, um, I'm looking forward uh, to John's talk on uh, wiring up superconducting qubits. The word is yours. Thank you, Tobias, uh, for the kind introduction and the ZI colleagues for organizing the session. Can everyone hear me, see me okay, see the slides? Uh, thumbs up. Very good, standard Zoom thumbs up. So I uh, chose a title which was not informative, but nonetheless, I thought it would be catchy, which is to wire up uh, superconducting qubits. Uh, it's not informative because there's wires and there are wires. There are small wires and big wires. Uh, and in fact, I'm going to talk about small wires in my talk, uh, setting it up for additional speakers. And what I mean by this cryptic comment is, if we look at a modern chip architect uh, chipset, this is a Z370 uh, chipset from Intel, there's a lot of stuff going on in this. And it, it's quite humbling actually to look at all the technology that goes into setting up a modern information processing system. And it has small wires and big wires. So at the level of small wires, one starts off with a switch. Uh, this is not necessarily the one shown in the picture, but one can imagine a FinFET, say, being a very good small scale transistor. And essentially it's giving you a zero and a one. Uh, and, and then there's a lot of science, right? There's a lot of classical physics and engineering going on beyond this transistor, which involves material science to think about how all of these layers are put together in a robust fashion. They're repeatable, they're reliable, uh, so on and so forth. There's electromagnetism to get all the signals in there with efficient coupling. And of course there's thermodynamics. Uh, these are of course dissipative devices uh, and they can heat up on very small scales. And if you get all of that right, one can then think about, well, uh, do I functionalize the logic that I have into processors and memory and so on and so forth. And if you start then thinking about, well, what does quantum change uh, in this stack? I think the stark fact is it changes everything, right? If one starts with a very different type of switch, uh, in fact, it's a switch that uh, can be both zero and one at the same time, as we know. So it's a very different set of physics and physical laws that govern it. Moreover, uh, this, the, uh, the secret sauce is in fact getting these little qubits or switches to entangle, right? so that you get a computational space which is much more powerful. And I think the point of uh, perhaps this talk and the other ones in the session is that scaling entanglement, which roughly speaking is the correlation between bits is hard. Right. So generating this entanglement is challenging and keeping robbers from stealing it is also challenging. And in the ways that you may lose your entanglement uh, is to an environment that is, uh, does not have an identity. So it may go into a bath in which you don't recover this information, but you may also have uh, robbers in plain sight, right? You may have wires, other qubits, so on and so forth that can also take away your entanglement. And this starts to get to be a very challenging problem uh, as you increase the number of qubit count. And I put crosstalk in parentheses because this word has different meanings for different communities. And I will give you some examples of at least what I was implying by crosstalk at the level of a chip and a cryo package. So the take home message is quantum is fundamentally different at all levels. So there's a lot of re-engineering and that has to be thought about. So uh, this is not the Z370 chipset, but let's say these are the typical parts of some type of superconducting system starting off with uh, room temperature controls on the very left, going to some type of cryogenic vessel in the middle, which has all sorts of discrete filters, uh, some that are becoming on chip, some that are still modularized, going yet to amplifiers, say, uh, toward the right, finally to some type of cryo package, and then in the very deep heart of this is your quantum processor. So I am going to res restrict myself uh, just to this little uh, cylinder here, right, in this talk and talk about crosstalk and scaling issues in that little uh, element. Whereas I think the uh, scaling issues and crosstalk and other types of multiplexing issues in the other elements of this stack will be discussed uh, by others in this session. So here are, the set, here are the pieces of the talk as I put them together. Uh, to start, one should have some reliable coherent device so that you have enough qubits and reliably can put these qubits together so you can start to separate materials issues or performance issues in your qubit from the design 
And the design, in fact, may have uh, deleterious sources of unwanted fluctuations or coherence loss in the classical electromagnetic part of it, right, in the cryo package. You may have losses at the level of your chip, and I'm calling this quantum crosstalk uh, in terms of how qubits couple to each other or more complicated quantum uh, effects. And then one can think about, well, how do I actually diagnose such errors? How do I actually go ahead and try to mitigate them? And I just wanted to give two examples where one can think about compiling a quantum circuit uh, for circuit-based quantum computing a bit differently to deal with such errors once you have some information on hand. And one can also even think about how to think about different ways to have an algorithm uh, execute quantum gates if you believe that there are certain noises that are in fact not fixable in an easy way. So given that it's a very short time, I had just one or two slides on each one of these topics to give you a sense of uh, what we were doing, at least in the lab, on these points. So the first one is chip scale coherence. So um, I promise to be as to give you an introduction in 15 minutes. So I have one slide uh, that says basically what is a superconducting qubit. Uh, at some very basic level, it's an oscillator. So electrical oscillators have Ls and Cs. So here's a classical capacitor, linear capacitor. One in this business typically uh, uses a Josephson tunnel junction, which will give you a nonlinear inductance. And that in, in essence forms a nonlinear oscillator. This oscillator, just like any type of potential well surface in quantum mechanics, will get quantized into discrete levels. And the frequency range that you typically have in, in this oscillator is somewhere between one and 10 gigahertz. So shown on the right is a picture, a scanning electron micrograph of a tunnel junction, 500 nanometer scale bar shown. The technology here is aluminum, aluminum oxide, aluminum tunnel junctions. And I wanted to give you a sense of uh, the lifetimes that one has in these structures, just to sort of put some of these numbers that we see in, in context. Uh, I tried this log scale so that hopefully there's not a lot of um, a controversy about them. So in particular, you imagine that this LC oscillator by itself, if it had no resistance, the Q would be infinite. Uh, but of course, life is not like that. There is some uh, effective resistor that's there. And this resistor in the form of materials defects or spurious modes on your chip or radiation, et cetera, will limit the coherence of this device or limit the quality factor. Some interesting numbers. Uh, if you take a tunnel junction as your primitive qubit, just one junction, put it in the most isolated environment that you can think of, a 3D physical cavity, you can measure typically of order of millisecond uh, lifetime. So that gives you a sense of what are the fundamental limitations in this type of Josephson junction technology. If you take uh, a cavity, after all the session was cavity QED, if you take the cavity part, take a superconducting cavity uh, that we are commonly able to access now, clean the surfaces and what have you, you get a lifetime of about a second, okay, in that. So these are very long lifetimes and much longer than the times that you hear for T1 and T2, say, of your superconducting qubits, telling us that when you start to engineer uh, functionality into the device, when you start to wire it up, then there are losses of coherence that can occur. And those are some of the things that I'm going to talk about. Uh, to give you a sense of whether these are big numbers or large numbers, one has to compare them for how long it takes you to do a the quantum equivalent of a flop, right? So if you want to do a single qubit rotation, uh, that can be very fast, uh, one to 10 nanoseconds. Uh, we thank our, our patrons uh, in this session for enabling these things. If you have two qubit operations, that takes a bit longer to generate entanglement. And just to give you a ballpark figure of what a very fast gate would be somewhere between 10 and 100 nanoseconds. Again, if you have something faster or slower, great. I just wanted to give a, a sense of the scale of the problem. So in terms of moving from one qubit to many qubits to wafers full of qubits, uh, one encounters all sorts of other fluctuations. And again, in the spirit of trying to disentangle what is really a problem with design versus a problem of materials, so we are typically building six inch wafers of these qubits. Uh, there's somewhere between let's say 64, one centimeter by one centimeter qubit chips on a, on a wafer. So that's what's shown here. Each one of these squares is a one centimeter by one centimeter chip with eight qubits in this particular run. The color code tells you uh, we were targeting a certain frequency, but at the end of the day, when you produce the wafer, what's the spread of frequencies you get? And the histograms here show you this across 36, uh, across the entire chip. So if you look between four gigahertz and 10 gigahertz, uh, it was absolutely horrific, right? So you see the histograms are very much overlapping each other, saying that we didn't have very good control of uh, at least the spread of frequencies on this chip, okay? And you had something like 12% error 
and what you were getting in, in the resistances or currents that you wanted. So fast forward 36 wafers, uh, we've implemented the improvement shown on the lower left, and you can see we have much better uniformity now, right? And that allows us to go into a position to say uh, better things about other loss mechanisms, and the histograms are much tighter, you can see on the bottom. Moreover, you can see this kind of little sine wave or the, this little curvature in the back, that's by design to do the cross resonance gate. So in fact, you can see that was totally lost uh, in the design on the, on the upper wafer. So starting with this, uh, how good are the coherence times? Do they fluctuate? Yes, they do, but they still are, are giving us reasonable values to operate with. So here's one qubit uh, showing you its T2 values. So in this case, T2 was uh, 132 microseconds in this case on this planar chip and was measured over two hours, right? And you can see a histogram of fluctuations. So there is some width to this. Uh, this is not a typical best device. This is now the histograms for all of the five qubits, let's say on this particular version. And we've done this for all our chips at the moment, but you get some interesting physics ideas already uh, percolating here. These ellipses tell you the extent of the fluctuations, both in T1 and T2, both of which are typically now over hundred microseconds for these chips, but they have a certain shape. So it's not obvious to me yet, uh, you know, what is really giving rise to these fluctuations? Why does it affect certain uh, quantities more than others? But it gives you a sense that there's more work to be done, but nonetheless, we are in a position that you can now look at other uh, deleterious effects. Okay, so this is another way to plot that data. So if you take these coherence times, compare them to uh, processors that are out there, this is comparable to, to long lived devices that are out there so that the noise mechanisms I want to go in in the next section are probably relevant and are simply not uh, limiting us to very low coherence times. So classical EM design. Step one, one has to pick the size of your LC circuit. If you make it very large, it will radiate. If you make it very small, it will concentrate the electric fields in a small area, in which case you will feel material defects more strongly. So what's shown on this plot on the horizontal axis is the amount of surface participation. So the greater the surface participation that you have, the smaller your features, the less the radiative loss. So in which case, if you would go to the right, where there's a lot of surface participation, very small radiative loss, you would measure, let's say, Qs of 10 to the seven. If you go to the other limit, make them very large to reduce the surface, you have much lower rates of Qs. So one has to sort of fig figure out where the happy balance is for the T1 and T2 that you, T1 that you want of your qubit. Moreover, one goes ahead and then thinks about engineering a proper mode structure, uh, any spurious modes that you have, let's say even in between qubits shown on the lower right, that's a little bit harder mode to find. It's not on the input or the output, but it's on coupling structures. They will also reduce coherence. And this one, which I call the lonely bond pad, I, I always find interesting to show to graduate students uh, in the modern devices that we have, we're doing more flip chipping and automated connections, et cetera. But in the older days, you were just wire bonding to each one of these pads. So if you have uh, eight qubits and you put an excitation on number seven, you can ask the question, well, what is the power that you measure on the other ones? And it's a function of how big your bond pad is. So if your bond pad was a millimeter, it's not crazy to bond to a device, then you have almost near unity crosstalk between those devices already with the electric field pattern. So you have to go much smaller to actually reduce this. So again, giving you a sense that there's some very unique design challenges you know, in these quantum de devices. Okay. So this is sort of the cryo package we're using at the moment. Uh, this is wired up, I think for 16 qubits. There are other ones for 32 onward. Uh, one does simulations to go ahead and make sure that the matching and insertion loss are small. In this case, uh, insertion loss less than 20 dB and crosstalk suppressed to better than about 50, 60 dB across all those lines. So you would think you're in good shape, but then of course quantum mechanics will give you other crosstalk right, at the level of your chip. So how do you find that crosstalk? So I wanted to advertise this method, which we're using a little bit more uh, recently. This is called cycle benchmarking. So just to show you the, the colors of the quantum circuit here, if you start with the gate shown in pink here, uh, this gate uh, is between a certain number of qubits shown on this sort of uh, you know, rows that are coming across here. You want to figure out what are the errors related to all the other qubits that are idle in your system or where errors creep from one channel to the other. So what happens with this pink gate is you would like to remove measurement errors. So you insert the blue boxes here. And what these do is they randomize your inputs and outputs and this removes so-called spam errors from the circuit. And then you can add green boxes here which are specific poly operators and they allow you to tailor and find out each one of those error channels. So this is a mouthful and I gave you the reference here if one wants to sort of look into this method in a greater detail. But the output of this is, let's imagine I take four qubits here and I wanna do a CNOT between five and six, say. 
I want to figure out what's happening with the idle qubits because I measure a simple fidelity of the C naught that may be pretty decent, but there may be all sorts of crazy things happening with the other qubits on your chip. And indeed that's what's shown on the right here. If I look at this map, it's a complicated figure. It separates the errors into different types. So the top row are single qubit errors. These are errors that involve two of your qubits. These are errors that involve the C naught and another qubit, so on and so forth. So suffice it to say with this type of analysis, choosing the right inputs and outputs, you can really get a handle on what are the crosstalk mechanisms that you have. And the utility of this is you can try to undo them. Right? You can go ahead and use pulse sequences that are composed to improve fidelity to undo them. Okay, so can you take this idea, in fact, and encompass it and put it in your algorithm altogether? You can, so let me show you this one slide example of this. Let's imagine that you would want a certain target state here on the left, shown in gray. Uh, so this is on the surface of the block sphere. It's a pure quantum state. However, the difficulty that you have is that you have some coherent errors. So they cause, let's say, a rotation of this state. And this rotation is random. However, it's a coherent error. So when you add them all up in a circuit, they are very, very harmful to you. So the idea is, well, what if I actually go ahead and put some random rotation shown on this plot here, these dash boxes. If I put in these random rotations and average over, over them, I actually tailor that noise, which is a coherent error into a stochastic one. Okay, and that's what's uh, implemented here on the right. The black is the exact target state that you want. The blue is any given output state that you would get. The orange dots are if I do this process, let's say 12 times, I will get 12 different values. If I average them together, I get the orange vector. So what you do is you trade this motion on the surface of the block sphere, which is a coherent error for something which is well aligned with your target state, but of shorter length. And there are ways to recalibrate that length. So you can do this noise tailoring to improve the depth of the circuits that you can run, shown here. So these are four qubit circuits where I run a certain number of C naught gates going from two to let's say 15. And you can see this randomized compiling, so to speak, these orange ones have lower probability of incorrect solution. And in fact, I don't need to average over very many instances to make this work. So finally, uh, how does one perhaps even use some of these crosstalk effects to your advantage? We ran recently an experiment with QTRITS three-level systems to go ahead and simulate information scrambling. Okay, so in this process, one tries to permute quantum information from one element to another. So this was the natural way you would think of a gate for doing that. It's a sum gate that moves I to I plus J. It's a horrible gate because it requires tons of gate operations. So in the end, what we did is we used the always on ZZ interaction as a, as a way to actually compile the gate itself. And in fact, there is a, a field which is emerging of flow K gate uh, uh, simulations or flow K gate synthesis, where you can use some of these interactions to put together these gates. So anyway, that was a very fast uh, introduction to some of the uh, issues that we're observing, some of the techniques. And we're, what, what we're moving forward with at the moment is to explore these issues in four different platforms that are there to complete a co-design cycle where we go from application to prototype. And that really is the function of the new center that we've started uh, in, uh, under the auspices of the National Quantum Initiative. So I'll stop here, hopefully uh, leaving some time for questions. Thank you. Perfect, uh, thanks a lot. So, um... Um, I think we have uh, maybe a time for, for one quick question and then, then we can continue. Um, actually, I would have a question. So concerning your um, uh, the plot where you reduced the frequency spread of your qubits, uh, which sort of extended, I think, over uh, roughly a gigahertz uh, with, with your improvements. So what is sort of the, is there sort of a target where you would like to get, I think, uh, or what is realistic to get to in terms of, of this frequency spreading? That's right. So the target depends on what type, in this particular case, what type of gate architecture that you want to implement. Okay. So we were looking at something which was very strict. Uh, let's imagine you had fixed frequency gates only. So there you have to really target something that was of order of percent, say, to do like of order of 50 or 100 qubits, right? And we hit this percent level accuracy for that. It is much, it's more reduced, of course, if you would like to have tunable qubits and so on and so forth. So this was for that stringent target. Getting to a percent or so is, is a pretty decent number for doing lots of things. Uh, and this is not the limit. What we are limited now by is sort of the angle fluctuations of the topography. So we can improve on that also. We just didn't need to do that at the moment. I, okay, I understand. And, and uh, so if you want to really have a, a, a truly scalable one, you probably want to minimize the overlap between different qubits uh, at different locations. Uh, yeah. So, uh, 
so then uh, but then it's uh, then there's probably at some point there's less of a you get you actually get more by uh, engineering your cryo packaging in that respect that, that you reduce crosstalk or so and and less from the qubit uh, from this qubit frequency uh, design or is it that's right. So there's a nested set of problems, okay. right? So we're only fixing them to the level that you so you're limited by. Of course, of course, makes sense. Good. Um, Another question on this slide. While we're here, key improvements. What do you mean by ultrasonically assisted development? So the this st stack of resist has the copolymer MMA on top with the Caesar resist on the top. So they have different developers that are there. So we tune using ultrasonic grids, uh, the amount of power and directionality of what we're doing in the development of that resist stack. Good, thanks a lot. Uh, so if there's no immediate other questions, I think we're right in time actually um, to, uh, to go to the to Flora's contribution for now. So uh, Flo, uh, he's currently a, a research scientist at, at NIST Boulder and uh, he joined uh, the Institute uh, nine to 10 years ago uh, from Grenoble and the uh, Institute NEL. And uh, so they're developing uh, on tools for quantum measurement and information science. And for example, parametric gates, uh, ampli parametric amplifiers uh, or optomechanical and microwave to optical uh, interconnects. And I think that's something we will uh, hear now or we'll hear about now um, in his uh, hardware for efficient measurement and massive signal delivery in superconducting quantum processes. So I'm looking forward to your contribution talk. Thanks, Tobias. Um, can everybody hear me and, and see the slides? I can. <laughs> okay, great, thank you. Well, hi everyone. Um, again, thanks for setting up this wonderful workshop. Um, I'm truly honored to be part of this panel. Um, and I will be discussing some of the recent work done in our group at NEST, where we're trying to address the upcoming wiring apocalypse that is looming over superconducting quantum processes. So I'm going to start with a quick outline. Um, I'm going to address which part of the scaling problem we're trying to, to solve. Uh, it's very much in the big wire, small wire uh, introduction from uh, uh, IRFN. We are talking about big wires. Um, and one of the options that we're going to discuss and offer is to use photonic links to, uh, uh, to replace standard coaxial delivery. And in the last part, I will also touch on um, alternatives to microwave circulators. So again, I'll start with some introduction. Uh, IRFAN already covered a lot of ground here, so that's gonna be nice. Um, these are the five DiVincenzo criteria for a, a universal quantum computer. And here I'm showing um, a, a typical, uh, um, so a somewhat old chip from the UCSB Google group uh, um, from the time where it was still possible to point at the individual constituent. And uh, here you have five transmods in a row. Each one of them is a, a two-level system with a resonance frequency in the four to eight gigahertz range, more or less. Um, and that allows us to check out the first uh, criteria, which is the initialization. We simply cool it down to dilution for each temperature at around 10 millikelvin. H bar omega becomes much, much larger than KBT, and they are initialized in their ground state. The coherence, again, Yafan talked a lot about it. It's still a, a work in progress, but we're already at, at a very interesting level where we can do interesting quantum error correction and things like that. The gate and the measurements are both performed via microwave pulses that are sent through individual control lines for the qubit or to the readout resonator or readout cavities that the qubits are coupled to. And it's actually the the delivery of these microwave pulses in the context of cryogenic operation, that's gonna raise the question of scalability that we're trying to, to discuss here. So uh, thanks to lithographic capability, uh, um, scalability has always been presented as a given for superconducting circuits. It comes with its own sets of challenges, uh, uh, like the, the previous speaker explained, 
but um, we can already build a fairly large network of them. Now, the signal delivery for the control and the readout of these devices uh, is taking the form of coaxial lines, and it's starting to take significant real estate in, in the dilution fridge, and even more importantly, have a large heat load from room temperature down to the colder stage. And uh, a recent estimation with typical coax and, and, and typical fridge um, have shown that maybe at about a thousand qubit, we're gonna, we're gonna run out of cooling power. And that's pretty far from the number of qubit we will realistically need for like a real useful universal quantum computer. Um, and so one of the questions we're gonna try to, to discuss here is how do we bridge these three orders of magnitude when it comes to wiring up this system? So there's a few options. Uh, one somewhat trivial in, in essence is to make bigger fridges, um, trivial in essence, but not in terms of engineering. It's, it's a massive undertaking. That's part of the IBM roadmap for the, for the next decade. Um, another option is to try to distribute the entanglement over multiple fridges. Uh, that can take the form of a quantum coherent microwave to optical converter, um, or even the uh, form of a cold waveguide that connects two different fridges. Um, in short, this kind of quantum interconnects between fridges could have massive rewards. Uh, but they are incredibly challenging uh, uh, to make them work at, at large scale. Somewhat simpler of an idea is to just try to put more qubit per fridge. Uh, for that, you can try to reduce the size of the coax and increase the density, and you're going to win some factors there. Um, you can also address questions like uh, CMOS at, or, or SFQ core processors at, at 4 Kelvin. And eventually, once you put all these things together, you may get a few orders of magnitude. Um, but it's, it's going to be a, a very big undertaking in terms of engineering to put all these things together. And so that brings us to the first part of, the, of that talk, where um, I'm going to present like an alternative approach that, that we, we've thought of uh, uh, here at NEST, where the idea is to replace an uh, attenuated coaxial line type of, of delivery with a photonic link, which is a very typical and mature technology from air photonics at room temperature, where you use laser light on which you encode microwave signals, carry it to a remote location, and reconstruct the microwave signal at your destination. And here we're going to apply it to cryogenic operation so that the remote location is at 10 millikelvin. It's really motivated by the idea of using optical fibers to wire up a cryostat uh, because these fibers can be cheap and small, which is good, but more importantly, they have terahertz of bandwidth and very low thermal conductivity. And so the question I'm going to try to address here in the, in the next few talks, a uh, few, few slides is, does it work at all? Like, bringing light into uh, close proximity of your quantum circuit has always been something that uh, the community has been scared of. Photon breaks superconductivity and therefore coherence. Um, and so do we have any light leakage? Uh, um, as well as the question of what is the heat load? Uh, um, so if it's too much of a heat load, is it going to scale? Like how can we get to this kind of million qubit type of number? So um, we've to answer some of these questions, we've devised a, a proof of principle experiment uh, where the photonic link starts with a 14-19 nanometer laser uh, that we send to an electro-optic modulator um, at which we, that we can use to modulate the intensity at you know, 10 gigahertz type of frequency. And we carry that modulated light down an optical fiber to a uh, indium gallium arsenide photodiode that we construct with full vector control the original microwave signal. Um, that kind of technology, we've shown that it works as well cold as it would at room temperature. Um, but we recently put it through the real stress test of driving a, a quantum device. So a 3D transmon here, so a transmon embedded into a, a 3D aluminum uh, cavity. There's one antenna that pokes into the, the cavity field. 
and uh, that allows us to either drive the qubit if we drive around 5 gigahertz or the cavity if you drive around 11 gigahertz. And uh, I'm going to start by wiring that photo diode to the cavity driveline. And I can generate microwave with it, send them to the cavity, and I can resolve a qubit state dependent phase shift uh, by homodyning the output signal. And um, so here I'm showing the histogram of the homodyne output signal, either for the qubit in the ground or excited state. You can see two very distinct uh, uh, distribution. If we integrate over them, we get a fidelity of about 98%, which is exactly the same that what we get if we drive through the regular coaxial lines. Um, and so we've seen that we pretty much can use it to generate signals uh, like a coaxial line with, and reach the same high fidelity single shot uh, uh, QND readout of a qubit. Um, in a separate experiment, we've wired the photodiode to the qubit driveline. And now we can use the microwave generated by the photodiode to drive uh, a qubit oscillation between its ground and excited state. Uh, we can reach Rabi rate, uh, uh, Rabi frequency that are in excess of 200 megahertz, so way faster than we actually can with transmon. Uh, and in, in that preprint that you can find in the archive, we also discuss uh, um, how we can maintain qubit coherence as well as how we can characterize the uh, uh, shot noise limited output noise of that photodiode. Uh, but I don't really have the time to get into too much detail here. So I'm gonna move on to the scaling discussion about the photodiode. And that's gonna consist in comparing the cooling power of a typical dilution unit, which is about 20 microwatt at 20 millikelvin. And uh, we're gonna, compare that to the heat load of either coaxial approach or photonic link to get a number of qubit, a metric of how many qubit could we imagine wiring up. So you have to start by considering the passive heat load, uh, which is about three orders of magnitude smaller for an optical fiber than for a typical 086 coax. Um, and that tells you that if you were able to drive around a thousand qubit, uh, uh, with coax, you can probably wire many millions with, with optical fibers. But now you have to also take into account the active heat load, either from the cold attenuation for the coax, or uh, from the fact that all of the optical power is more or less dissipated in, in the photodiode in that photonic link. That leads to a total heat load that is uh, um, a very duty cycle dependent. So how often do you drive your qubit over a sequence? or over an entire computation. And if you, um, you know, that's what I'm planning here, the number of physical qubit we could drive by the function of duty cycle. For the coaxial approach is very much dominated by the, the passive heat load of the coax. For the photonic link, regardless of which impedance you want to drive, um, you have something that is very strongly dependent on, on the duty cycle due to that optical dissipation. And so for reference, uh, we, we kind of extracted some overall duty cycle from recent milestone experiment, and it's kind of in the percent regime. Um, and already here, we can see that the photonic link seems to have some, some uh, interesting advantages in terms of how many qubits we could drive. Uh, but also one can think about uh, um, while keeping the sequence as tight as possible in terms of, of number of gate and duty cycle, one can imagine reducing how often do you repeat that sequence uh, um, and therefore do, in doing so reduce the duty cycle and maybe enable a larger number of qubit closer to maybe that, that kind of million type of number. So uh, some consideration here, um, this kind of of photonic link can be used also for delivery at 4 Kelvin or for other application. We are looking into other type of photonic link with smaller heat load to basically anything we can do to uh, use optical fibers. And um, we're also working on, on options to get signal back up to temperature. So um, that's pretty much it for the photonic link. With the last few minutes that I have, I'm gonna touch on the subject of these non-reciprocal devices. So if I go back to kind of one of my first slides and zoom in on what that readout box is here. 
Um, the idea is distinguishing that uh, phase shift, which corresponds in a two distribution in IQ space. And because we're limited to driving with a few photons, uh, we need a very low noise measurement chain. And that typically what, uh, uh, what a measurement chain look like. At its core, you have a parametric amplifier, which are uh, the lowest noise amplifier uh, that quantum mechanics allows. However, um, even though they've allowed a lot of progress in the field, these things work in reflection. Therefore, you need a bunch of circulators to control the signal flow toward the output and protect your device from amplified noise. And these circulators um, are becoming uh, somewhat of an issue. Indeed, they are uh, pretty lossy, so they reduce your measurement efficiency. You lose some of your signal before you hit your amplifier. Um, they use large magnetic fields, which are not compatible with uh, the quantum devices themselves. And they're also rather big, um, SMA type size. And um, in, in this PR picture from IBM, you can see they start taking, again, a significant part of the real estate available at low temperature. So the question in, in the last few minutes is, can we integrate directionality within, these, within directly the quantum circuits? And so one of the very attractive alternatives is to use traveling wave amplifiers, which have been developed in the earphones group uh, over the past few years. Um, they have large gain over a massive bandwidth with large dynamic range. Um, the noise temperature are still being worked on uh, and, and showing good progress. They still use somewhat high pump power and have sometimes a little bit of residual reverse gain, which so far seems to have hindered the ability to measure a, a, a qubit without the use of any sort of magnetic isolation. Um, and so here at NEST, we've taken a slightly different approach that starts from understanding how a circulator works. So that's a, a, a typical circulator with three ports uh, that forms an interferometer for, for your microwave signal. Uh, and placed in a big magnetic field, you get a non-reciprocal phase shift, which breaks reciprocity and allows traveling signal uh, to go from the input to the output, but not from the input to the third port. And what we're going to do here is mimic that kind of behavior, but with loops of parametric interaction. So you can imagine something like that with splitters and mixers uh, that could re reproduce these kind of actions. Um, and we're going to do that with supercomputing resonators and parametric frequency conversion. So that led us to develop what we call the field programmable Jonathan amplifier. I'm showing a diagram here. It's all you need to know is it has three resonances, A, B, and C, that all depend on the flux through the same squid. And that allows us to have all-to-all -all tunable parametric coupling between, between these modes. And um, we can, in fact, in situ decide what kind of behavior that device is going to have based on how we pump it. If I do nothing, you have full reflection on the output and input, so it's kind of an open or a short circuit. If I use one pump, I can either program it to be a frequency converter between input and output, or a phase sensitive or insensitive amplifier between any pairs of these, uh, of these three modes. What's more interesting is when you get to pumping it with three pumps, you can break reciprocity and make it behave like a circulator or an isolator or even a directional phase insensitive amplifier where you have forward gain and reverse isolation without the use of magnetic fields. And if you had a force pump, you can trade off the isolation for phase sensitivity, which allows you to even further reduce your noise temperature. So recently we've used that force mode of operation to do the uh, efficient measurement of a qubit without the use of a, of a circulator where we have signal in the forward direction with phase sensitive gain, but no amplified noise ever make it back to the qubit, therefore maintaining its coherence. And so despite not having the same bandwidth nor dynamic range than a, than a, 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 a traveling wave amplifier, we have the ability to have ultra low noise and it's fully integrable on chip. So looking forward, this kind of, of amplifiers, we want either to use them to uh, basically make quantum feedback a real resource for quantum computing, 
And we are foreseeing the ability to transform the conventional readout cavities into tunable couplers or non-reciprocal amplifiers that we can in situ uh, uh, make an open circuit to protect the qubit from uh, a pure set effect or measurement induced phasing, and then switch to, uh, uh, for example, a, a, a you know, uh, forward gain to, to do a high fidelity measurement. So with that, I'm, I'm out of time. Uh, thanks for your attention, and I am happy to take questions. Great. So uh, thanks a lot for this uh, this nice talk. Um, I think we have time for maybe one or two very quick questions. Um, so uh, maybe from, from Tony, is the performance of the FPGA uh, sensitive to uh, asymmetry in this quit Joseph junctions? Um, I mean, it's not really um, that asymmetry will slightly move where your frequency are at zero flux, but you can always tune to the right DC flux to, to get back to the kind of frequency you want, and it doesn't affect uh, uh, any of the pumps. So um, it's, not, it's not really a sensitive uh, uh, device to the asymmetry of the, of the squid. OK, uh, thank you. This seems to answer the question. Um, then another one. Uh, you said the 1,000 qubit limit uh, before showing these three types of uh, improvements. And when you're using these improvements, uh, e.g. the freight just linked in a, in a network, uh, so where would you see the limit after these improvements? OK, so um, going to smaller coax, you can get maybe a factor of three or four. At some point, there's diminishing return in making smaller coax in terms of heat load. Uh, connecting fridges. Uh, through this kind of waveguide, you can imagine like an easy factor of two, maybe four, maybe 10. It's really getting tricky to 10 fridges connected through this kind of waveguide is a monstrosity. Um, once you um, make bigger fridges, you can probably, that, that I'm going to have a hard time answering that question. What is the kind of cooling power we can expect from fridges in 10 years? Factors, yes, maybe an order of magnitude. I'm not sure we're going to get the three orders of magnitude we need. And so once you put all these things together, you might get closer to tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, and, and maybe, who knows, maybe a million. Um, it just seems like a lot of things have to work at the same time uh, to get there. Uh, and so that that's, looks like a big engineering challenge. Mm -hmm. Good. Thank you. So then I think we're uh, right in time. To uh, Thanks again for your talk. And um, let's uh, switch over to uh, John Martinez, um, which we're happy to have here. Um, I'm not sure whether you want to share a screen or so, or, or you just do it orally. Yeah, I, I have something to share in a, in a, a little bit. Uh, okay, good. Um, so, uh, yeah, thank you very much for the Sorry. invitation. I had wanted to uh, give a talk on a plan to scale to a million qubits. It's something I thought about uh, and discovered how to do it last summer. And, of course, Google's been talking about it. I actually had written a paper on this recently, but unfortunately, I, I'm not able to talk about the basic ideas behind this. So. Uh, you know, in terms of, you know, giving a talk today, I, I didn't know quite what to do. So what I decided to do instead was just to kind of talk about answering the questions that were given to us and I'll, I'll summarize them. And I think it covers a lot of the basic points and some of the ideas that we have in, in, a, in a way that I can talk about. So I'm hoping that'll be okay. Um, for the first question you have, what's the limits of coax wiring, which has been talked about. Uh, if you look at what we did for quantum supremacy, I think you can scale that up to a few hundred or maybe a thousand if you redesign your refrigerator. Uh, and, you know, obviously beyond that, there's a clear uh, problem. Um, uh, what I would say uh, people haven't talked about is, you know, in the end, getting the coax to work was actually an issue of reliability. And in first, we, the coax we were using, uh, it was just failing all the time. So you have to do that. 
to give you a magnitude of, of the, the issue, uh, you know, uh, uh, it's 200 coax or quantum supremacy, maybe 2,000 cold uh, mechanical joints to get the experiment to work. We have enough uh, uh, cryostats in the lab that we have maybe 10,000 mechanical joints at low temperature. And uh, given those numbers, it, it's really quite surprising that you can get coax to work on these big systems, you know, as long as you're careful about it. As you said, obviously that's not very scalable. What has been talked about uh, with other people and something I've thought about, of course, is to use a printed circuit board technology, a uh, more particularly flex to solve your problems. Um, and I've been working on that for three or four years right now. Uh, it's a very, probably one of the most challenging engineering projects of my career. And, uh, but, you know, we were able to find solutions. So, uh, you know, I think Flex is going to work well. I unfortunately can't talk much about it, but uh, I, I think people uh, should not be um, um, saying that there's any, uh, you know, roadblocks at a thousand qubits from wiring because, uh, you know, Flexus printed circuit boards, you know, coaxial wiring is kind of like soldering wires of building electronics in the 1940s and 50s. And since then, printed circuit boards are the way to go. It's the way to go. It's clear you can do something good there. It's hard though, okay? The, the second question was the question about static or tunable qubits. What's the, the, the future? What are we gonna do? Uh, my basic answer to that is I really don't care as long as I have good system performance, okay? And, uh, and it's a system engineering optimization problem. You have to do that. Now, I know that the common physics way to solve this is to say, let's our, make our best single qubit that we can and then try and figure out how to get them to work together. The approach that I took the last 10 years or so was to say, okay, let's do a, a overall system zero engineering approach. Let's say we make a two qubit gate that's 10 nanoseconds, which we do now, instead of one or 200 nanoseconds, then we need 10 times less coherence to make something good. And that was kind of the approach uh, that we got to get the Sycamore. Of course, you know, the coherence times of those systems is about, um, uh, 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 20 microseconds, we have to push it up. I, we think we can do that. Um, I would say the important thing in building a system, it turns out, is building, um, building something where uh, you can turn off the interaction, okay? It's because when you have the on, on interactions, they're going to degrade your single and two qubit gates in a way that's very complicated. And when you scale, it's not working right. And that was something that was really great in the Sycamore architecture. We had more wires to do the controllable coupling, but when you looked at that, we could really turn things off. We could tune it up well, and that gives you a lot of, of things. So uh, the real answer to this is, you know, it's good to have fast gates. You need large on and off ratios. And, you know, in the end, it's a complicated systems engineering trade-off. Then in the end, you don't know about until you test the big system, okay? And that's what people are doing, so that's great. Uh, the third question we are asked is, what's the hardest item moving forward? And, you know, basically everything, because the problem is a systems engineering problem. You optimize one thing, the other things are, are going to, to get hard. I would say one of the things that we figured out in the Sycamore chip was how to get rid of crosstalk to a significant degree so that we felt you can scale. And that was, uh, Irfan mentioned that, that was uh, really good because it's very hard to predict and understand that. And, and that uh, way that we built with basically connecting all your ground planes works really well. Um, and I'm going to say that right now it's a very nice because it's a good time for the field because we can evaluate things by looking at performance. And the basic thing that happens is when you build a big system, you can degrade in performance. And if you don't understand all your physics well 
and engineered and gotten the physics right, uh, you know, especially crosstalk, you're going to degrade. So, um, for example, you know, two qubit fidelity, be able to do it, uh, you know, in, isolated and simultaneous, all the qubit skates are running at the same time to know if one is uh, interacting with the other. And we have good ways to test this, okay? And the quantum supremacy was an experiment that enabled us to test the system performance. And the good news was that when we ran, uh, ran the whole qubit, it, it, the errors were more or less what we expected from single and two qubit errors, so that's good. But it's a well-designed system. It's not natural that you necessarily get that. There's a bunch of different ways. People are running algorithms. People are talking about quantum volume. All these different uh, algorithms, all these different ways of uh, benchmarking the system is good. And it's kind of an exciting time where people can do that really well. And you can see how well your systems work. Uh, but you have to build them and test them and, and, and fix your problems, of course. So kind of in summary here, um, I think it's a great time for the field that we're building system and we can test these ideas. I'm confident that we can scale up uh, quite well using existing ideas. Uh, and uh, well, we just have to do it and, and see, what the, see what the problems are. Uh, and uh, you know, it's, it's it's just a matter of doing it. Um, I just want to summarize and end uh, to uh, just say that it's hard to get good fidelity in large systems. And, uh, you know, it's not just an engineering problem. It's a really hard physics problem, too, because there's a lot of things that can go wrong that can uh, mess up your system. And uh, we have to improve the fidelity of superinducting qubits, and there are ways people are thinking about doing that. Uh, we have to work on connectivity. Uh, you, you, for the surface code to do error correction, you need to connect to the four nearest neighbors in the square grid. And connecting to more qubits is trickier. More things go wrong. And when people have to measure and understand that, of course, scaling, things can go wrong when you have more qubits. And, uh, you know, I, I mentioned, again, the gate times are important. You know, faster is better. Uh, um, it, it, it's, it's faster for its own sake. And also, uh, you have to, uh, you don't have to push against coherence time so much. With all that said, I think it's an exciting time for the field. And a lot of interesting things will be happening in the next few years and a decade. Okay, thank you. Perfect. Um, thanks a lot uh, for this. Um, so maybe let's uh, let's see. Uh, are there? I see there are some questions. Uh, so, for example, by Gaia. Um, so, are you not worried about too many different ways to benchmark systems as as these uh, get larger and more complex? And, and does it not make progress and performance difficult to assess uh, across different approaches? What are yeah, um, you know, uh, that, that's always a problem. Although, if you automate your benchmarking, uh, you know, in case it takes time to write the code, you can just try all the things, and you know, uh, uh, things, things will work fine. Uh, we think the quantum supremacy way to benchmark a machine is quite good, and that works very well up to 30 or 40 qubits. There are other ways to benchmark it. Um, I think right now having a large number of ways to benchmark a machine is interesting because uh, then, then you can see if they give you the same answers and which one works well and which ones are good. I think over time it will, um, it will compress down to the most useful ones. But I'm willing to say let's do the experiments and, and see what makes sense. In the end, if it's just writing code, uh, you know, you should be able to automate all these things and uh, get a lot, a lot of information about the system. Okay, uh, thank you. I think this answers, I hope this answers the question. Um, we have another question, for example, uh, could you comment on the timeline uh, that you see for these engineering challenges uh, related to scalability and uh, also how does it map to other material systems, for example, solid state? Uh, qubits or solid state, for example. Yeah, um, you know, it, it all depends on the different technologies, what the timelines were. And, uh, you know, when I was at Google, 
I had uh, an idea on how to proceed and have, have how the timeline is. I'm, I'm really not able to talk about that anymore, unfortunately. But I would say, you know, there's a natural progression of building bigger and bigger systems. And when you build a bigger system, then you have to fully test it uh, to make sure nothing new went wrong. The nice thing about the quantum supremacy is experiment is that scaling up from nine qubits to, you know, 53 and a square grid was a big step. And we managed to solve a lot of the engineering problems so that it basically worked well out of the box. Uh, you know, we've been, that took what, six years, okay? But, but we were able to do that. And uh, you know, things work well. So we feel that scaling to the next steps uh, are nothing horrible is gonna go wrong. Yeah, okay, you have to test it. So uh, um, yeah, you know, uh, Again, you can, you can, it, it, Google's talking about a million qubits. You can think about some logarithmic scale of, of how that would be over time. And, you know, you have to see. In the manner, you have to get it to work. So that's the hard part. Good. Uh, thank you again. Then uh, we also had another question. Um, always on interaction seem like they will present a challenge for realizing deeper circuits. Uh, so what are the strategies hardware or software, and do you believe, uh, so what strategies, hardware or software, do you believe are the most effective uh, to address qubits selectively? To, to, to address qubit what? Uh, to address qubit selectively. So what, uh, what strategies, hardware or software, do you believe are the most effective to addressing qubits selectively? Okay, I, I didn't understand uh, um, the, the, the last word you said in the sentence. <laughs> Okay, selectively. But the video broke up a little bit. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, so um, always on, I would just repeat the question. So always on interactions seem like they will present a challenge for realizing yes. deeper circuits. Uh, yes. And what strategies, hardware or software, do you believe are the most effective to addressing qubits selectively? Yeah, so the always on interactions is, uh, is a problem. And the way we dealt with it um, when we were doing experiments at UCSB is we have the qubits on and off, uh, off, and was off. It was turned off enough that you know things would be okay, but uh, but uh, it didn't get turned off. So what happened in the Sycamore chip is we put another tunable, just essentially a tunable resonator between the two. And by adjusting the frequency that a resonator, you could turn off the interaction. So turning on and off the, the two qubit interaction really made things a lot easier to um, operate the device and get it to work properly and tune it up. So that was a, that was a pretty important invention. And we've been working on that for many years in various forms and uh, that's great. It, it requires more wires and requires you to operate tunable qubits, but uh, it, it really is quite effective for building a system, okay? Because having, you know, a, a tunable interaction, boy, that's, it's really, really nice. Now, if people have always on interactions and can get gates to work well, that's fine. But the problem is, you know, maybe you have two qubits and it works okay, but once you have four nearest neighbors, it gets a lot harder to get well. And it, we're, we're anxious to see if people can get that to work well. Uh, it, it's hard. And okay. it's more hard, hard, you know, theoretically, but mostly it's hard practically to like to hit the parameters and get everything to work. So it's an interesting option, but we'll see. I understand. Um, good, thank you. Um, so I would have a very quick uh, specific follow-up question to this, and then I would actually think we, we maybe uh, go um, open up the discussion to everyone. I think that's, that's just in time. Just a follow-up question. So, so even if you, if you have a tunable interaction, which you can, um, uh, which you can uh, put to zero or to turn off, um, uh, what is sort of the... Um, uh, so what is the, the problem of, of uh, exactly uh, the, the sort of leakage um, through the chip and, and how can you really, uh, is there a way to really deal with these? Uh, and I also think that these tunable interactions are not, also have their sort of their own constraints to some extent. So uh, yeah. 
how what is the prospect in this chemical? Yeah, in terms of leakage, mostly you worry about leakage to the two state, okay? And that can be mitigated. And uh, uh, Google has, um, has done an experiment on this and they've submitted a paper on it. So you'll see there's quite a large amount of data and ideas there and uh, uh, I think people will like the fact that we know how to deal with the problem. Uh, it, the problem right now is getting the paper past the editors because they think it's so technical. And I thank you for that question because we think it's extremely important. No one's talking about it. It's one of the big problems. We show the problem, we show the solution. Uh, yeah, I guess it's just not you know, that sexy or, or easy to talk about. So, so it, it'll get out there. Uh, and then yeah, there, there are things that go on with the, the tunable coupler you have to deal with that's still getting investigated. But basically you want to keep it in the ground state uh, so that it keeps its, its working properly. The nice thing is, is you can turn off the interaction. There might be some residual effects, but then you can detune the qubits. So you turn it off in two ways. And because of that, you can really turn off the effective interactions hugely and not worry about it. And this is really great for calibrating the chip, for example. Good. Um, thanks a lot. So um, maybe let me quickly uh, share my screen again, and then we sort of wrap up the, the more speaker focused uh, part and, and let's then uh, open up the discussion uh, a bit more broader and, and uh, going maybe back to this original questions on uh, on asking, okay, uh, what can we, from, from all what we learned now, uh, what can we, uh, is, there, is there a certain uh, need uh, or uh, can we maybe even identify a certain, um, uh, certain areas where it would make sense to sort of uh, officially communicate a, a best practice uh, or, or so, which, which could help uh, really pushing the, 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 uh, the field forward. Um, so here again, uh, these are the questions that, uh, that uh, we uh, asked you to have a look initially. Uh, sorry, I, I'm not sharing it. Uh, that, uh, that we asked you uh, initially and, and which also John also uh, answered uh, with his view. So um, maybe um, uh, maybe what what I would suggest now is that that uh, people maybe quickly think about and see whether uh, their opinions actually have could be changed or or maybe even reinforced. And and uh, if uh, I would appreciate if if some of you uh, could uh, maybe give a quick comment on on saying uh, hey yes that's uh, it's a really good I don't know. This was a really good point, and, uh, and I like this, and, and, and maybe this changed my mind or so. Uh, and you can just write this uh, in the chat. Um, and um, yes, so uh, so in this in this uh, respect, uh, let's do this now. Um, and uh, I will uh, then in in a minute uh, open up the discussion and and maybe start asking. Uh, questions uh, to all the, the speakers. Um, and again, uh, everyone is welcome to either um, ask questions directly or, or, uh, or write a question in the chat, which we then, uh, which we then um, forward. I, I, I uh, just to, to start of off course. the discussion, mm -hmm. um, I was very happy that there was a discussion about, for example, the circulators. And uh, when you want to scale up, uh, that's, a, that's a significant problem. And I think it's good that people are, are looking at that. One of the things about a conventional circulator that's very nice is they have decent bandwidths, say 500 megahertz or a gigahertz. And of course, they're wider bandwidth devices, but even that. And we have to you know, remember that you're trying to measure the qubits quickly, and you're trying to frequency multiplex them to some degree, you know, even if it's five or 10, that's useful. So, uh, you know, having a gigahertz circulator uh, is, is kind of what you want. And it's great that people are looking at active circulators and the like, but unless you have bandwidth, 
of, of order that. And of course, the saturation power, as the speaker mentioned, is important. So that's uh, that's a really important technology to uh, to figure out, and I hope people would do that. Uh, the parametric amplifiers are pretty good, but it turns out we use four Kelvin hemp's to uh, you know further amplify, and uh, they consume a lot of power. Uh, you know, if you talk about buying a lot of hemp's, and that's something else that would uh, be good is to uh, work on even the three Kelvin, four Kelvin amplifier stage. Mm -hmm. Thank you, uh, Florian. Do you want to, yeah. uh, since you mentioned yeah. this, I think, do you want to comment on that? Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, so definitely uh, I was trying, at least in my presentation, to uh, really put in contrast the, the benefits of the, the massive bandwidth and, and uh, um, and dynamic range with, with some of the other benefits that you can have from these kind of parametric active circulators. Uh, and yes, bandwidth is, is definitely necessary for quantum computing application. You're gonna want uh, to move away from the tens of megahertz that we have to hundreds of megahertz, if not a gigahertz, to be able to uh, um, you know, uh, multiplex at least at some level, like, like John said. Uh, and, and all of these things are, are being uh, investigated. Right now, like the current type of device we've shown, uh, uh, that I've shown in my talk, we, we can realistically get to 100 megahertz, maybe a couple hundred megahertz of bandwidth. The gigahertz is gonna take some rethinking exactly of how we're gonna do this. And I can uh, you know, imagine some clever combination of, of traveling wave and, and multi-tone parametric interaction that could get us to, uh, to this kind of bandwidth as well as uh, um, filter synthesis and engineering to, to get kind of the closer to this kind of gigahertz response. Um, and then these kind of devices work uh, have higher bandwidth at lower gain. They are typically band gain bandwidth constraints. So the more gain you want, the, the less bandwidth you have, uh, which um, is usually taken care of by having some sort of post amp, um, a, a, a typically a hand amplifier that do consume a lot of power. There are options uh, uh, to follow, you know, these kind of narrow band amplifiers by uh, a traveling wave amplifiers or combining different stage of parametric amplifier that could get us to some amount of gain. And there are work that's being done in um, using electro-optic modulator to bring signal back up to room temperature. Uh, this kind of, you know, uh, again, up conversion to optical frequency. It's still very much in its infancy. So I don't know how much of a, a, a technological breakthrough it's gonna be, but that's kind of the stuff that are being looked at to try to, uh, um, address the heat load of, of hemp's 4 million qubit. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, I'm not sure, Irfan, do you have a, a comment uh, on that? Sure. Just sure. to I, uh, give you. I agree with both what Florent and, and John was saying, of course, that these are, as you scale up, getting all these signals out in an efficient manner is, is, is quite challenging. Uh, I think I want to dovetail on what Laurent just said, you know, this idea that maybe you can upconvert the signal or have other kinds of encodings or what have you. I think it's important, at least from my point of view, when I think about building quantum devices to sort of settle that. You know, what's the actual signal you want to measure? Because noise is a signal just like your signal. So if you want to measure a certain bandwidth of quantum signal, if your amplifier or circulator or other system is not matched to that, you will either be losing signal or you'll be adding too much noise. So if you want actually good performance, it's good to know what the spectral content is, uh, what you'd like to amplify. And I think as, as people are thinking about different ways to modulate that or compress that or, or, or modularize that, that will also dictate a bit, you know, what your amplification chain will look like. Okay, uh, thank you. So maybe if we, if we actually do stay may, uh, at this sort of higher, um, higher, le uh, so higher levels on, the, on how to get signals out and in of the cryos that, um, I would um, I would have a few questions. So, so maybe uh, let's let's go one one step back. And um, uh, at what what 
so we, we, we identified a few problems now. So, so there's, there's still a room for improvement uh, sort of on hands and, and also uh, circulators, which might be integrated and, and are magnetic free or active circulators. Um, the question is, um, it's sort of if you would gauge on, on what level or, or how much time does it still take until we are maybe at the level where we can say, okay, this is really a, a good solution for, for uh, um, maybe even several architectures like stackelic or flux tunable qubits or maybe even for one qubit. So how much, how much longer is it that, that one uh, could define maybe a, yeah, a, a best practice on how to wire up your cryostat uh, to, to get the optimal performance out? Um, and or can you just generally comment on that? Are we actually maybe at the level uh, at at this level already? Um, and uh, and what could be a good good message to this? Um, maybe uh, let's start with John uh, again, just to, to make the round. Well, you know, I think if you look at the pictures of the uh, Google experiments or the IBM experiments, you see kind of how people are doing coaxial systems and. Uh, these work very well for systems up to, let's say, 50 or 100. We can deal with that. And given that we're going to be prototyping systems for like forever, you know, on that level, because you learn a lot about system performance at 20 to 50 to 100, uh, you know, there's a, there's a good technology set for doing that right now. And then, uh, you know, in my view, it's, you, if you want to scale to more than that, uh, you know, you have to use circuit boards, as we all know, uh, you know, from regular technology. And then it's just a matter of doing that. Now, we're doing it to some extent on our chip mounts right now. And then we just have to get more and more sophisticated with how you, you build the chip mounts and, you know, integrate more wiring or filtering into mm -hmm. our circuit boards. And that's what people will be figuring out in the future. I, I, I kind of saw a pathway there. So I think it can be done, but you know, you have to test it. Of course. Thank you, uh, Irfan. Yeah, I agree with, with that saying that there's some intermediate prototype uh, size of system. And I think all of the implementations are similar plus or minus uh, you know, small differences. But I think to the point of whether one wants to do physical science to explore a certain set of phenomena that can be seen at you know, 30, 100, 200 qubits is one question. To develop some technology that is millions of qubits, it's, uh, that's a very different ballgame. Right? I'm thinking about what that would look like. So I think your question was, what are the best practices uh, that one could perhaps involve and put in? I think for the small number, uh, we've sort of converged on that kind of wiring and there's changes to that. Uh, and then as John was alluding to, there's uh, to get to the million, there's a lot of new, uh, new things that need to come. Mm -hmm. I see, Flo, you have a comment on that? Uh, or you agree? Yeah. <laughs> so I, 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 I just agree with, with what they said. I think, uh, um, you know, if uh, if you're thinking about buying a cryostat to uh, start working on, on qubits, wire it with coax like everybody else, it works for doing science, developing new type of qubit, new type of gates, all the research going on and most of the development up to you know, tens and tens of qubit, we have something that works really well. Um, everything else is a science and a research project in itself, uh, uh, whether it's the uh, interconnects or, or the amplifiers or even the design of some of these large chips. Um, and you don't want to uh, to first order um, tackle all these problems at once. Uh, one thing at a time is good. And for if you want to work on amplifiers, uh, stay with coax for now. And and you know we'll see when we get there to to millions of qubit, but we're not quite there yet. So I think, as they mentioned, we have a pretty robust architecture today, even including transmons, whether they're fixed frequency or flux tunable, like the transmon is here to stay for quite a while. Might I don't know if that's going to be the, the qubit in use in 50 years, but for now it's it's there and will help, uh, uh, will be part of the, the, the core of the architecture for the, the, the next decade or so. Mm -hmm. 
So, um, yeah, thank you. So, so maybe we can actually, uh, this might be related essentially to this, but, but essentially going forward, um, and it's of course also something which, which uh, is of interest to us. So, so, uh, and, and relates to essentially the first question. And I think John answered this, uh, already. Um, but, um, so, so currently, uh, currently you, the approach is that you have a uh, room temperature control electronics, and then, and then you bring the signals down. Um, of course there's these other like, uh, SFQ or, or called CMOS. And, uh, maybe I just wanted to, to, to hear the, the comment from, from Flora and, uh, and Irfan, uh, at which level, uh, you think this, this could be interesting and, uh, and maybe what is the, the, or how long will sort of this flexibility of, of room temperature electronics, um, uh, still last? And, and when do we really need to define the field, um, well enough that it, that it's actually worth it to, to start thinking about, uh, more integrated solutions, um. And maybe this this also goes a bit to the this uh, also is, is related a bit uh, to a different question um, and maybe we start with Floron where where uh, where someone uh, asked whether um, uh, the the this the, concerning this optical approach whether this essentially not only shifts the challenge just to a different regime but uh, is it really something which is really scalable to uh, to more? Okay. Uh... It's a, it's a pretty big question. Uh, so the, the, easy, the easy question is the, the one that was asked in the chat, whether the optical approach is just shifting the challenge into a different regime or a different field. And the answer is yes, to some extent, uh, as always. Um, in, it seems to me that uh, the, the current experiment that we ran, the performance of the components are very uh, common in in the the field of air photonics. There's there's a lot of stuff that has been figured out. I mean, a lot of the telecommunication work like that. There's a lot of the challenges have been addressed, uh, and when applied to cryogenic temperature, it seems to really follow everything we would expect in terms of output noise and heat load and everything. Um, so, I'm not too worried. Other than obviously, the heat load is something that needs to be uh, to be addressed carefully in order to for that approach to work. Um, now, when it comes to other approach like cold CMOS or SFQ, I mean it's obviously something that is uh, that are incredible avenues of research. Um, I'm not going to be the best person to make prediction on how fast they're going to work and how well they're going to work, uh, it's, but. Um, they are uh, likely to become interesting, uh, uh, interesting engineering development and approach for these large scale uh, quantum computers. Um, but yeah, that's pretty much what I can say. Yeah, thank you, uh, Yefan. Yeah, let me add a, a few words on that. So I think uh, all of the answers are viable depending on what axis you want to look at. So there is a question of performance so things that I think about are very fast feedback. Once you have enough coherence time uh, to go ahead and actually read, read out your qubit with high fidelity or some other error syndrome and actually feedback upon it, then you do care about the one foot per nanosecond propagation delay uh, physically in your cables. And you also care about the 150 nanoseconds say delay in your FPGAs. So at the level of high performance, you could use that today for doing different things. Then there is the idea of signal multiplexing. Are you having frequency crowding? Do you need to have more complicated encoding? So that's somewhere in the middle, right there. Thermodynamics, probably also somewhere in the middle. Uh, and if you solve those other classical problems that only have one way communication with all your signals coming out in an efficient way, maybe never, right? So I think all of those answers are, are viable depending on what axis you want to look at. Okay, thank you. Uh, I'm not sure whether John has, a, has an addition to uh, his already give an answer? Uh, yeah, there, there's a lot of different ideas out there and it just has to play out to see which ideas work. So it's hard to say, you know, what are the winners and losers going to be there? Um, I'm gonna say what's nice is there's kind of a, a brute, more of a brute force approach to, to move ahead, which means you know what to do right now. And then I'm sure in the long run, people will come up with 
clever alternatives and then uh, systems will get even better. So th there's a good pathway here in terms of moving the field forward. Okay, thank you. So maybe for the last uh, few minutes, which we have, uh, maybe let's uh, let's go back and 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 think about uh, again a bit more on the uh, on the on the chip level system and and again there. So uh, and this uh, I understand this is maybe a very open question now, but but what is maybe the the immediate potential there uh, on on finding a, a certain architecture guidelines, maybe uh, defining a, a standard for, I don't know, uh, and uh, for example, pet sizes uh, of your, uh, of your, uh, of your, um, of your bond pets or so. And um, just uh, how, how much would it sort of bring maybe uh, people, yeah, how much could this uh, bring uh, the field forward uh, in terms of, okay, there's a certain, Set of standards, and and everyone will understand. Okay, if I if I adhere to to making pet sizes which are only ten micrometer uh, or hundred micrometer in, in diameter, um, then uh, everyone else will immediately understand. Okay, the crosstalk, uh, at least from this, is, is maybe less uh, less of a problem. Um, maybe I start with Irfan uh, again. I think there are. You know, I'm not sure about the standard part of it, but I think there are good principles, all right, in terms of, you know, we have, we've discovered the following effects are problematic, right? We've, we've discovered the following uh, crosstalk effects that involve noise outside of your frequency band is important, right? And that's sort of something that's not obvious. If you're building an amplifier, there may be noise channels that come outside of your band of measurement. You build idle, you build qubits, you measure the fidelity of the ones that you're working on, but the idle qubits matter just as much. So I think guiding principles may be, may be useful to summarize in some place. I don't know if codifying that into a sort of a standard layout um, you know, is, is sort of good at this point. I mean, others may have other viewpoints, but I think at least understanding some of the things that we agree upon, we should look out for. And you already heard that coming through in the presentations today. Of course, yeah. the general agreement and things that are uh, that deleterious, that's useful. No, thanks. Um, I think uh, I also agree it, 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 it was a surprisingly uh, or maybe not so surprisingly, a uh, very good alignment between the different uh, different fields, yeah. Um, I, I want to make a comment on standards. Um, uh, you know, being a field uh, kind of pushed by physicists, physicists each like to do their own thing. So standards to me seem quite unlikely. Um, I also find that, you know, there are a few things that we've talked about for years that are absolutely essential and we tell the field and then it takes people five, maybe 10 years to rediscover it themselves, which is fine, which is good. It's nice to have uh, uh, other people looking at that too. And I appreciate that. But, uh, you know, yeah, more communication would be good. It's not like we need standards. It's just you, you have to kind of look at the global, uh, global systems engineering. But in the end, it's good. People are doing different things. We each learn as long as we're sharing uh, uh, what we learn. That 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 works really well. So, uh, uh, sorry. If, if I can just uh, uh, piggyback here, um, as as Irfan said, I think there are a few things that we've learned: uh, um, surface loss, and so. Uh, de designing devices with low surface, surface participation ratio is something that everybody is working on right now. That's part of the core of the of the design of, of, of any uh, quantum chip. All the microwave hygiene of, of mode and all of these things that are tractable, in principle, even just in simulation, are things that are being worked on. And I would not say that there are so much a standard. Uh, working at the National Institute for Standards and Technology, I should we should know. Uh, it's not quite that level yet uh, um, in terms of design or even the way uh, uh, sometimes performance are reported. There are little things here and there uh, where standards could help. Uh, for example, noise temperature of, of amplifiers. There's been some discrepancy in the literature on uh, how people report uh, how well the amplifier uh, uh, works, and uh, it's it's 
that would benefit maybe from a little bit of standardization in terms of practices, very much in the way that, for example, randomized benchmarking kind of standardized the way people would report their gate fidelity. There is really one way to do it, even though there are, there's always stuff under the hood going on with randomized benchmarking that people sometimes say or, or, or not. So there are some little level of standardization that could be done in terms of how people report performances. Um, but in terms of design, it's mostly what we've learned, the common sense thing that we've learned as a community. Mm -hmm. Can I add one more comment to this? Of course. Yeah, so I wasn't sure exactly where you were going to go with the standards question, but one thing I think that would be tremendously beneficial in my point of view is to have platform independent benchmarks of quantum performance. So for example, mm -hmm. each quantum device, each quantum architecture layout does <laughs> something that's different. And you know the physics of that is not settled, right? Uh, you know how do you quantify that with one number, a set of numbers, you know, however that works. But I think that allows you to sort of explore the different corners of quantum mechanics and its complementary nature by having sort of an accurate description of what your system can and cannot do. No, I think uh, yeah, I think uh, that's essentially where what uh, what I was going for, and 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 yeah. It, Maybe standards was was maybe not the, the right formulation, but I I, I fully uh, yeah. I always yeah, would guess yeah, that, that I, sort of a, a sort of fostering communication also in that respect. Um, and I think it's a very interesting time right now, where people are doing various things, various benchmarks, various standards. We look at that, and then over time, people will figure out what are the best standards for various applications and and that, that can be a that can be a rich field and the nice thing is if these are um, algorithms that you program on your computer in the end this should be software so it should it should be be able to be portable from one experiment to the other so th that that bodes well for being able to test systems better okay good um, so thanks a lot. I think this is a very nice uh, final word that it's an exciting time now to, to think about these questions. I think this uh, in retrospective also uh, uh, validates uh, maybe the, the, the original idea of this, uh, of this uh, session or of this workshop. Um, and I think in this case, uh, yeah, I would like to, uh, I think we, we close the session now. Um, uh, maybe if the co-hosts and the speakers can, can if they want, they can quickly join in. We can do a quick discussion, but otherwise I would say we, we quickly, uh, or we, we stop the, the, the session for now. And uh, we're looking forward. Uh, so thanks uh, again to all the speakers. Uh, and of course, uh, if the attendees can clap their hands, uh, either silently, virtually, or, or using the, the, um, uh, the, the clap hands feature exactly. Um, but uh, thanks a lot for all the speakers. Uh, it's really appreciated. I like the discussion. And um, we are looking forward to, uh, to the final session starting in about, I think, 45 minutes um, uh, on, uh, on more software and higher level stack approaches. So thanks a lot to everyone and uh, goodbye. Yeah, thank you for organizing a nice session. It was good.